I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The book club where we are coming to a town near you. Yes, we just added two new cities. Sorry, I screamed. I'm very excited. I'm so excited. You guys, we are coming to Los Angeles, California. Ever heard of it? The land where people become stars. And we're coming to Phoenix, Arizona. We're hooked on Phoenix, baby. We are doing January 18th in Phoenix, January 19th in LA. I'm so excited. You can also come see us if you don't live in Phoenix or Los Angeles in San Francisco, Denver, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Oh my God, as this is airing, we'll be in Nashville and the day after we'll be in Atlanta. So come hang out. We hope to see you there. And now the regular intro. This is a podcast where we are swirling around the drain so that you don't have to go down the drain if you don't want to. We are reading the books. We are giving you our top line analysis and telling you all the juicy deets. But if you want to read along with us, this one I really recommend you hop into. You know what we are? What? We're taking like a swab of bacteria from your sink drain so that you don't have to go down it. And we're taking that swab and we're looking at the bacteria under a microscope and giving you a full medical report, a scientific analysis. A DNA test. But if you're like, you know what? I want to hop down there and meet the rats and shake their hands. Buy the book. Buy the book. This week, we are reading Down the Drain by Julia Fox. And before we get into it, Claire, if your life was to be written into a memoir, how would you title last week's chapter? I'm doing it. What are you doing? Okay, you know how this podcast kind of devolved for me personally into whatever the opposite of a self-help podcast is like a person who can't help themselves update? Yes. I am doing a good job of starting a little routine. What is your routine? Okay, so what I've done that has really worked for me, so if all the other ADD wish I was somebody better, but I'm 30, almost 31, and I still have not gotten a grip, I've divorced the morning routine from a specific wake-up time. Great. So it's no longer like, first you wake up at 6, and then at 6.04, you're brushing your teeth, and then at 6.19, you're drinking your cup of coffee. Oh my God, you brush your teeth for so long. Well, something important about the routine is you've got to give yourself like budget area. (laughs) Sing the happy birthday song 39 times. (laughs) Anyway, I'm no longer doing that. What I'm doing is I'm just saying, when I get up, this is what I do. Yeah. And sometimes I get up and it's 7.30 and sometimes I get up and it's 9.08. I've been waking up, doing a quick load of laundry. I just dump it in the wet part. Or if it's already wet, I dump it in the dry part. (laughs) And then as I'm making my coffee, because now I'm trying really hard to not spend that much money because uh, the post-wedding has left me a wee bit drained. Sure, down the drain, if you will. (laughs) So as I make my own cup of coffee, I drink a big thing of water and I empty the dishwasher. I make sure all the dishes are put away. I'm habit stacking. And so these are my two little tasks. And then my reward is I get to have fresh hot coffee. Yum. And that's my habit right now. And I think like I'm going to, in six years, when I've really proven that I can do that consistently, I think I might add a third thing. I'm excited for you. Who knows? Yeah. Watch this space. It's happening. It's been one week, but it's been like a really good week. Yeah. It might have even been 10 days. Ashley, if you were a celebrity and you were to write a memoir, what would last week's chapter be called? It would be called Teetering on the Edge, but Not Falling Off. Oh, I love that. Stay close. I have been feeling quite restless and I feel like I have this feeling every couple months and then I like do something not smart. And I feel like I'm recognizing my patterns and being like, hey, this restless feeling, why don't you just like use it to clean your apartment or something instead of like getting a boyfriend you don't like? Whoa. I know. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) So that's like what I'm working on right now. I feel like I still might get like a tattoo or something little, like a little fun thing for myself. I feel like you just got a tattoo. Not in a while. Oh, yeah, I forgot I did. But maybe another one. Yeah. Where would you put this? I think I want to get little ants on my wrist. For a bug? Yeah. I love that. Or a bat. Ooh, for who? For bug? Also for bug. Because she looks like a bat? Uh Uh-huh. I got that. Weigh in if you have any ideas. But I think overall, I feel like I'm not going to make a bad decision. I also am taking a couple weeks off drinking because I was like, throw that on there. Why not? Look at you. I love the like doubling down. Health and wealth, baby. Yeah. Anyway, so should we work hard through this tale of trouble and triumph? Yeah. And I don't want to brag. But Julia Fox sent us copies with handwritten notes in the beginning. It made me cry. They were really sweet. Oh, I do want to clarify that we did interview Julia Fox. The interview will be posted as a little bonus episode on Thursday. And by little, I think it might be an hour and a half. (laughs) Yeah, we talked for a while. 
but our opinions are our own. You guys know I'm kind of a crazy person. And I will say crazy shit to people's faces. And I was like kind of prepared to have to be like, what was this? But I ended up loving the book. And what it was, was a very well done memoir. And so I just recommend you guys read it as well. And that isn't because she's our friend now. So Julia Fox was born February 2nd, 1990. For some reason in my head, I was like, oh, she's three years older than both of us. And that's a very different age. I can't believe she is truly our age. (laughs) Yeah. She was born February 1990, and this book came out today. So she was 33. But in 1996, she moved to New York City from a small town in Italy, where she had been primarily raised by her grandfather. So she lived in Italy with her mom and grandfather, but her mom was not very present. And her dad lived in New York, and her parents were together. Legally married. They were not physically together. Right, but they were legally married and considered themselves a couple though they lived in separate countries. And I think that that is an interesting thing to keep in mind. She says now they are, I think, separated? No, I think she says they're still together. She says they're still married, whatever it is. I think that that is an important dynamic that they considered themselves a couple, but were almost never in the same place. So she had been living with her mom in Italy, technically, but really her primary caretaker was her grandfather. And she moves in with her dad in New York City in 1996. So she's six years old. When she lands in New York City, she had been there a bunch of times to visit her dad's family, but this was different because they were moving permanently. And her little brother, Christopher, had been left back in Italy. I feel miniature too, but not in an insignificant way. I feel small in a way that feels exciting, like I have yet to be discovered. The thought of getting lost in this concrete maze sends shivers down my spine. I gulp down the thought and ignore the fact that I'm starting to feel insignificant and inconsequential, even a nuisance, perhaps. I can tell that my dad isn't used to having kids around because I'm constantly jogging behind him to keep up. So they go into his building where they have a doorman, but it seems very small. Yeah. They had an apartment. She had her own room, and it's the first time she's ever had her own space. So that is a real bright side of this new life. And it's definitely like a bit chaotic, but a little bit of a step up from where she was in Italy. Yeah. Her dad is not home that often and leaves her to her own devices pretty regularly. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to her, so he just locks her in her room. Every other time she had come to visit him, she says, the last time I was in New York, we were homeless. The worst place we stayed was a dingy squat house in Chinatown where over 20 people slept on mats all over the floor. So this is like pretty relatively stable to what she grew up with. But again, it's not safe to just lock a six-year-old in their bedroom for hours while he goes to work. We didn't have a lot of money. So if I wanted something, I knew the one way to get it was by taking it. So she starts stealing pretty regularly. She steals from stores. She steals from her dad. She'll just go into his room and take some cash and she'll just like start stacking cash. She steals from other people. You know, she's being locked in this room and so she would sneak out onto the fire escape. There was a kid next door that she was friends with. She would go out into the hallway. She figured out a way to steal cable for them. So she has a tiny little TV in her room and she spends all of her days watching Jerry Springer and like daytime television that her father would normally say, oh, you're not allowed to watch that. But like he couldn't stop her. He wasn't there. And that's really how she starts disassociating from a young age. She gives a little bit of background into her parents' relationship, which is that when they were both in the U.S. together, they were always fighting, always screaming. Her mother was always very cold. At four years old, I darted back and forth between my parents, coaxing my mom not to cry and pleading with my dad to give me the passports. Finally, he told me where they were, and I promptly told my mom. I felt it was my duty to make her stop crying as she was starting to scare my brother, who had begun sobbing uncontrollably, too. So she spends most of her time with her neighbors. My parents' constant arguing over money has left an indelible mark on my psyche. I vow that I will never be like them. When I grow up, I'm going to be rich. There is like somewhat of a support system in New York City for them. Her dad does have a mother who lives on the Upper East Side and a sister named Beth, who seems to be the permanent caretaker for the mother. But they have a really weird relationship. And she recalls this memory where Beth shares something a therapist had said to her. And the grandmother says, you need to fire that therapist right now and makes her call up the therapist that minute and leave a voicemail saying, me and my mother have decided you're a bad therapist for me. I will go elsewhere. I'm too young to fully comprehend what I just witnessed, but it changes my perception of their relationship permanently. There are adults, and there are adults that love her. Her grandmother's constantly taking her the MoMA and the Met and opera and bringing her to Central Park to watercolor. So there is love, and there's a lot of emphasis on harboring and nurturing her creativity, but all the adults in her life seem a bit wacky. Yeah, it's just in no way a nurturing love. Like the only nurturing love she's ever experienced was from her grandpa. She talks about being dropped off at school on her first day and her dad takes her to school and she begs him to come inside and he just kind of drops her at the door and bikes away. There's no coddling. 
I mean, it is just a story of all the crazy New York City stories. I can't get into all of them, obviously, but I have to call out this one that when she was little, she wanted to be in a movie and her dad said, I'll get you in a movie. And her dad invests in this like indie film called Fire Dancer. And she gets to play a dead body in Afghanistan as a six-year-old. And she's like, it sucked, but I was excited to be in the movie. And then the movie didn't come out for years because I think the producer killed the director. Yeah. The friend that her dad gave all the money to, the producer killed the director over a fight about this movie, which obviously delayed the production of this movie. By the time it finally came out, they went to watch it at some premiere and her scene had been cut. And I'm just like, God, what a crazy thing for a man with no money and a child, two children to invest his money in. Yeah. What a crazy story. The parents' relationship is not just like toxic and weird, but it's also very violent. She's talking about a specific fight where her mom backed her dad into a corner and yanked every glass picture wall off the frame one by one, smashing it over his head. Then she went to the kitchen cabinets and began pulling out the wine glasses, the glass dishes. We were swimming in a sea of glass and I started to get worried for my dad. I ran across the shards and stood between them, imploring her to stop. He took this opportunity to flee the apartment, probably going to Marissa's house. My mom retreated into the bedroom where she began sobbing. So Marissa was her best friend's mom. So when she first starts going to school, she makes a best friend right away named Mia, who she actually makes a point to say at first she was suspicious that anyone would want to be her friend because she's just so accustomed to this fairly lonely life. But she and Mia became inseparable. Her mother was named Marissa. And she spends a lot of time with me and Marissa. Marissa is a single mom who really takes Julia in. And this is the first of many sort of surrogate families that she joins. She has these very intense and all-encompassing friendships where she just usually ends up joining the friend's family in some way, essentially becoming like sisters with another girl. So her and Mia are inseparable best friends. They spend tons of time with Marissa. And then her dad starts spending time with them and having an affair with Marissa. And Julia catches them one day when she's little. She sees them kissing at a sleepover that they're all four having. And she knows that it's wrong and she doesn't know what to do with this information. Then, of course, when the mother figures it out, she turns to Julia and makes her confess. And she is now no longer allowed to see her best friend Mia. She's forced to change schools. And she feels frustrated because she has a suspicion that her dad is still seeing Marissa when the mom goes back to Italy. And she's like, why am I being punished for what he's done? I mean, for years, she suspects that her dad is still seeing Marissa and and her only friend, her best friend, she's no longer allowed to see. And years later, they reconnect. But, you know, with that kind of separation, it's not the same. And she also, because she is from Italy, and I think she comes from this unstable background, every time she goes to a new school, they call me weirdo and freakazoid. They make fun of my accent and the way I talk. I don't have any clothes since my dad never takes me shopping and they make fun of me for wearing the same thing every day. So she has a hard time making friends. So to lose this one friend is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. She is actually so withdrawn and kind of ADD at school that the social services get involved. And she says, they seem to be asking me increasingly complicated questions that I don't want to answer. So I better get my shit together and start acting normal. She is diagnosed with ADHD. And instead of putting her on medication, her dad enrolls her in transcendental meditation classes. So she's like seven or eight years old in TM classes in New York. And it actually does really work when she's doing it. She obviously doesn't continue it forever, but when she is actively practicing transcendental meditation, it really helps her focus and recommit to school. She makes a new best friend named Danielle, aka Danny. And she also talks about when her mom is in town, she's not really allowed to have friends. She says it's maybe because of the Mia Marissa situation, but whenever she brings friends around, her mom is extra cold and extra harsh with her. So during the few weeks a year that her mom is visiting, she has to go back to like an extremely solitary lifestyle. Her and her mom will get into screaming matches where Julia will be like, I hate you. And her mom will be like, I hate you more. They really do not get along. I'm nine years old and I've mentally and emotionally checked out of this family. And she says, over time, my dad begins to unravel. He becomes increasingly volatile. Beatings with the belt are normal. I think he is trying, but he's just a very stressful guy. I don't know how else to say it. She gives her 9-11 story. This one will give a pass because she lived in New York. She was uptown. She was at school. And immediately, any parent who could come get their kid, the parents were coming quickly because there was a terrorist attack on the city. And you want to be with your family to let them know you've survived. So the kids whose parents worked downtown were brought into another space because their parents likely didn't survive. She was the only kid left in this room. And she starts freaking out because her dad worked on job sites all around town. He painted houses for a living. So he could be anywhere in the city. She's like, could he have been there? She's freaking out that her dad has died. And then he finally at night comes to the school and was like, oh, I grabbed my camera and ran downtown. And it's like, okay, Steve Aoki, you have a child who's just been left at school. 
9-11 ushers me into adulthood before puberty and completely takes over my life. So she is pretty traumatized. She's constantly afraid of the sound of planes. And really, no one's there for her. So she makes a new best friend named Ella, and she becomes part of Ella's family for a long time. Ella has two older sisters and a mom, and I think they're relatively wealthy. Her story is just dotted with the stories of other broken families and the ways that like they took her in. But also that they themselves were like struggling. Yeah. She talks about the mother who had been divorced and every year on her anniversary would make all of the girls talk about how ugly her ex-husband's new wife slash former mistress was. This is also the first place that Julia tries pot. So it's a pretty loosey-goosey lifestyle at this house. And so they smoke pot for the first time. She loves the feeling of being high. And this is where she's introduced to the concept of a dominatrix. She sees Ella's older sister, Kat, is a dominatrix, and she just is so impressed by the way she is confident and cool and strong in her outfit. And it's like, well, that's a cool thing to be. There's also that thing where the older sisters are introducing their younger sister, who's her best friend, to things that she should really not be introduced to. Her and Julia start going down to St. Mark's Place to get piercings all the time. She gets her nipples pierced and she's 11 years old. She also gets her tongue and her lip pierced and says her dad doesn't notice. And I'm like, did he look at you? Look at you. Those are visible piercings. This is when she starts partying pretty regularly. She's 11 years old. She goes to a party and gets drunk and high and a 26-year-old kisses her. After finding out that she's 11, he goes, oh, damn, I thought you were 16. And then he goes, fuck it. I wanted to kiss you anyway. 16 is still illegal. You adult man pervert. I mean, 11 is dis- like That's, that's so disgusting. young. Even though she is drinking and partying, she, of course, obviously, emotionally is 11. And so she even knows, like, she runs and hides when he goes to the bathroom and doesn't want to go any further. But she's, like, developing her body. She's going through puberty. She has a really big butt. And she says, apparently, this is a compliment because it makes a lot of girls migrate jealous. And I admit it. I love the attention. And again, like, she has no real support system around her because her dad is just not very present. Her mom is in town maybe a month a year, not at one time, like two chunks. And her surrogate families are kind of an ever rotating group of women where it's enough to like teach her a few things and make her feel temporarily supported, but there's no true landing space for her. So eventually Ella's family moves to California and now she's left alone again. And she has to find a new best friend and she finds Trish, whose mother is an alcoholic hoarder. Trish is a year older, but never comes to school, is only there once or twice a year, is known for giving blowjobs. She's 12 years old. That's her reputation. And she talks to her and it's like, what's up with this blowjob thing? And of course, it's teenagers being teenage rumor kids. Trish never lets Julia come to her house. And then a few weeks into their friendship, she's like, fine, you can come use the bathroom. They go in. Julia sees piles of garbage everywhere. And the mother is just drunk on the couch starts screaming to kick Julia out of the house. The daughter starts screaming back. Trish, the daughter, throws like a metal cup at the mom and it slices her open. And the mom calls the cops. So now Julia and Trish are on the run from the cops called by Trish's own mother. They're 12 years old. So they like run and try to like dye their hair to be on the run. They get picked up by the cops and then just brought back. And Julia's like, you can't send her back to her mom. You have to let her come home with me. And the cops are like, shut up. At this point, she also starts going to AA meetings with Trisha's dad, who lives uptown in Harlem, not as an alcoholic, but as just a people watcher. After a couple of months of meetings, nothing shocks me anymore, but I do learn that it's never too late to change your life. The woman who woke up on the bathroom floor was almost 50 before she got sober. That gives me hope for some reason. She also gets much more involved in stealing. It goes from just like little petty theft to full on robbery at Bloomingdale's. Like she'll go to Bloomingdale's, try a bunch of things on and sneak out with clothes under her clothes pretty frequently. I understand the power of appearance and I see how rich people are regarded. We don't like the private school girls. We want to be them. They just seem so clean. I love my new pants, but nothing beats the thrill of walking past metal detectors and getting away with it. They start getting tattoos too. My dad says we're worse than the girls in the movie 13. He laughs and thinks it's funny. So Trish then gets taken to Oklahoma by her mom. She has to move again. And again, she's left without a best friend. Why does everyone always leave me? I yell into the pillow. It's not fair. My grades are suffering. My home life is a nightmare. My mom is now pregnant and I overhear my parents discussing the baby's due date with my mom reassuring my dad that he's the father. I'm just surprised that they still have sex as they seem to despise each other. 
Her mother still does not live in New York with them. I don't think her mother ever lives in that house with them. She told us later in the interview that they never lived together under one roof. She was only ever visiting yeah. on vacation. I cannot believe they're having another baby. All they do is fight and scream and hurt each other. And then not see each other. He's having affairs. Who knows what she's doing in Italy? They're always mad. Like, what are they getting at trying to have another baby? I also don't know what even happens to this baby. Like, where does it live? Because she mentions her younger brother, Chris, a lot. I don't even know if the younger brother has a name. I mean, of course, the younger brother has a name and exists. But like, it's very interesting how it's just like a part of the story and the mom is not involved. She just has story after story of these middle school kids. It's very euphoria. But they're all just hanging out and smoking weed and doing drugs and hanging out with adult drug dealers. She tells a story about hanging out with her friends. She finally gets into the popular group at her new school, which has metal detectors and is very intense. And there's always like one random rich kid whose parents don't care about them who can kind of pay for things or host them. And this girl locks them out into the balcony and then tries to jump off of the balcony herself. And this is just like how they were living. Yeah. They're 12 years old and trying to talk a girl back from the brink of suicide. So she has a new best friend at this point named Rose. This is like her most toxic and enamored connection yet. Her and Rose are just absolutely inseparable. They're obsessed with each other. And at this point, she also has one teacher. Of course, there's always the one teacher who's like saying something that gets through to a kid. And her creative writing teacher is like, you're not really writing anymore. And she's like, I'm just going through a hard time. And her teacher's like, write it down. And she's like, why didn't my teacher ask how I was doing, though? Yeah. And so she does write it down. And her teacher's like, wow, this is really good. I'm going to share it with the class anonymously. And of course, the whole class is like snickering and calling it corny. And she's like, all right, I vow to never share again. Yeah. And I'm really glad she unvowed. So her and her best friend, Rose, they graduate eighth grade. She's like, I can't believe we got through it. But I think the school just didn't want us there another year. So they all passed us. And that summer, she is spending the summer again with her grandfather in Italy. So she's leaving all her friends. This is pre-cell phone, pre-internet. So she comes back. Her and Rose are going to different schools, but she assumes they'll still be best friends. And she gets back. Rose has kind of moved on a little bit over the summer. Everything is a little bit different now. And she's like, fuck it. I want to be back in Italy. So she's having this raucous summer in Italy where she's staying with her grandpa. So she's pretty unsupervised. She's hanging out with her cousin all the time. They just walk into town and go to bars every day. And she sees this man that she falls in love with. Giovanni. She becomes obsessed with him. They have sex. He takes her virginity. He doesn't know she's a virgin. I think she might be 13, 14 at this point. I think she's 14. He's like in his 20s. Yes. And she becomes obsessed with him. He's in town for the summer. And, you know, sometimes he's interested. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes he just drives by her house and honks his horn and she knows to run down. Everyone in town is calling her a slut. It's like the talk of the town. She's both like ashamed and enthralled by sex. And she's obsessed with Giovanni. He is manipulating her. He's constantly like, if you don't stop acting like this, then I won't come see you anymore. Like, if you don't do this, I won't come see you anymore. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's why a 24-year-old dates a 14-year-old. Yeah. So that he can control everything she does. And it is just the start of a really devastating pattern where she just becomes so... She uses the word addicted a few times in this book. She becomes so addicted to the approval of these men that she is in love with that she loses her entire self to their grasp. So she gets back to New York for the school year. They're all now in high school and they've all split up for high school. She goes to Rose's more fancy high school, I think, to pick her up. And sure enough, Rose has moved on during the summer and she's going to meet up with her new friends at the park where Julia feels very not included. And she's not having fun and she's like, all right, I'm out. Bye. Yeah. And so she goes home to her mom and she's like, can I go to high school in Italy? And they're at home with the new baby. Her mom and her dad are under the same roof for a few months because her mom has recently given birth to her youngest brother. Who has like taken her bedroom? So she, I think, is back in the living room. It's now two adults and three kids in a two bedroom and it's tight. When it used to just be one adult and one kid with their own rooms. Her friends feel like they've all ditched her and she's just like, I want to get out of here. I want to get back to Giovanni. I was having so much fun in Italy doing whatever I wanted because my grandpa was going to bed early. I want to get back there. And her mom is like, okay, works for me. And she looks up her old high school. They find a host family and they ship her off to Italy. So then she gets to Italy and she starts school. And this is not like her summer in Italy where she's just living with her grandpa unsupervised and like going to the bar with her cousin every day. She is now living with a host family who's quite strict. They have another daughter who won't speak to her. And she's going to a pretty strict high school where the classes are actually very hard and classes are six days a week. So on the weekends, she's going back to her grandpa's house for like, what, a day and a half But for the most part, she's like drowning in schoolwork. She doesn't know anyone. They all call her the weird New York girl. In New York, she was too Italian. In Italy, she's too New York. And then she makes a friend. 
And then she finds out that her friend Trish, who had moved to Oklahoma, is now back in New York City living with her dad again. Rose has a boyfriend on this thing called MySpace that Julia's never heard of. She's running to an internet cafe because at home she's only allowed to have 30 minutes of computer time that she has to split with her host sister. And so she logs on, learns about a top eight, finds this guy Ace, who apparently is a drug dealer. His MySpace page is covered in drugs and guns, and he has 10,000 friends. You know the type of MySpace I'm talking about. And she's just like, well, this was a huge fucking mistake. I'm with the strictest people in the world. All my best friends are hanging out without me on this, this new thing called MySpace. And I don't like anybody here. Then she meets a group of girls who are like kind of the cool girls. And she's like obsessed with how old and mature they seem. They all wear like heels to school and have serious boyfriends. One of them is engaged. And they're all dating men like 10, 12 years older than them. But they party and they take her in. And now she is having the time of her life. So she finds out Letizia, her host sister, has a huge crush on this guy that they see on the train all the time with like a bright blue mohawk. So Julia introduces them. She's like, you can't keep staring at this guy on the train. So she tries to talk to him. And then Letizia is like kind of pissed because she was never planning to talk to him. Well, also because in talking to him for Letizia, she's like, oh, yeah, I'm from New York. And he's like, oh, that's so cool. And it turns out they like the same bands. So she kind of steals him. If Letizia had zero chance before, now she like is out of the running. Like there was still the hope that if we talked, he'd like me. But now we know for sure he likes Julia. And I will say I understand Letizia in this situation. Yeah, you're really, really, really beautiful, cool New York friend. Can't talk to this like punk rock hot guy. Yeah. And be like, thanks for talking to me. Are you interested in this dud I happen to live with? Then Letizia stops talking to her and it's like a total bitch. And so Julia goes to the club with her cool friends and sees the Mohawk guy and makes out with him. And then it gets back to the family somehow and Julia gets fully kicked out. But she doesn't tell her parents. Instead, she just finds a way to get into her mom's apartment that's in the same town and just starts living alone. Yeah, so I guess her mom had an apartment that she had been staying there. And now that she's back in New York raising the kid. Nobody's there. So she's like living in this apartment for free and just going to school and like actually having the time of her life. And meanwhile, one night I log on and Trish messages me immediately. Rose got sent away to rehab. Her sister said two guys came in the middle of the night and kidnapped her and their mom paid them to do it. No one has heard from her since. We know about the troubled teen industry. And she starts having less of a good time in Italy at school. She's having a hard time. The teachers are really mean to her. The Pope dies. This is the funniest line in the whole book, so we can't skip it. Okay, go. The Pope dies. And so they all have to go to the Vatican to wait in this long line to pay respects to the Pope. And so she's been waiting in this line for hours and hours. People are mad at her because she's such a slut, I guess. After six hours waiting in line, she had been a bitch to someone in line, a guy named Leonardo. And then when they're inside, she's like overcome with emotion. She apologizes to Leonardo. They hug. And then one of the priests from her school is so mad at her and the rumors about her that he comes up and slaps her across the face. And she goes, the rest of the trip, I'm fuming. Did I seriously just wait 16 hours to get slapped in the face in front of the dead Pope? I didn't even get to have a moment with him. (laughs) I feel like out of all the crazy things that have happened to her in her life, getting slapped in front of a dead Pope. I'm so sorry that that happened to her. (laughs) But it's so crazy. I love that she goes, why didn't you slap him? Yeah. So then she's like kicked out of that school, which is run by boy nuns. What are they called? Priests? I don't know. She gets sent to the girl nuns. Her mom goes, they'll be nicer. And she goes, great. So they won't hit me. I don't think that that's true. I think that that's the opposite of true. So it's the end of freshman year. All of her friends' families leave for the summer. She's alone in Como. She meets this girl, Veronica, who she kind of knew from school, who's like, do you want to smoke weed with me? And they go to her house and it turns out her dad is this furniture magnate and her mom is like a former Russian model and their family is kind of kooky. But Veronica, all she does all day is smoke weed, binge and purge. And Julia's like, cool, I guess we're best friends for the summer. So then Julia, all she does is smoke weed, binge and purge with her. And this girl is rich and she'll like take her around and be like, buy whatever you want. Let me get you this Marc Jacobs thing. Let me get you this. So then they become best friends. They're hanging out all the time. And for Christmas break, she goes back to New York to spend time with her family. And she, of course, doesn't see her family the entire time. She goes right to Trish's house. And Trish is hanging out with Rose's ex-boyfriend, the MySpace drug dealer. Who is the reason why Rose got sent to trouble teen school? Because her parents were like, we don't know how to get you away from this guy. And listen, what they did was wrong. Obviously, we know now that the trouble teen school is like not actually helpful. But I get how her parents were like, we need to do whatever it fucking takes to get you away from this man. This man may be worse than that school. Yeah. Especially if you don't know how bad the school really is. Anyway, so she walks into this room. There's Trish. There's all these adult drug dealers. They're 15, 16 at this point. 
I guess she's about to turn 16 in February. And she tries ecstasy for the first time. They hand her a pill. She takes it. She gets super high. She falls in love with Ace. They have sex everywhere. All over the apartment with other people around. And then they go downtown. They get matching tattoos. She gets his name. He gets her name. She gets his name little on her wrist. And he gets her name like in block letters on his forearm. Yeah, like gothic block letters, I think. He starts telling everyone, this is my fiance. He's just like taking her around. He's like, you can never leave me. And she is also intoxicated by it. Like he's obsessed with her, but she is infatuated. He says, I swear when you walked in the room, I said to myself, I'm going to marry that girl. They go and get these tattoos and the tattoo artist is like, oh, how long have you guys been together? And Ace is like, shut the fuck up. That's not your business. And she's like, from then on out, it wasn't this like fun romantic thing. It was like tense and awkward. And I do think that that relationship had like seven good minutes. All seven of those good minutes were when they were high as shit on MDMA. The next day when I open my eyes, I'm startled for a moment and don't remember where I am. The room is dark and cold and quiet. Kyle snores next to us and Asa's body is wrapped around mine, restricting me from going anywhere. My head pounds. He feels like a stranger. She like goes up to go to the bathroom and he freaks out that she's leaving. Over the next 10 days, my brain absorbs a shit ton of drugs as well as everything there is to know about him. I'm a nerdy gangster, he says, and I laugh. I stabbed this motherfucker in the eye in broad daylight in 96th Street, he says with this proud smirk as if he's showing off. She tries to leave at one point to go to her family and he freaks out that she's going to be with another guy. So she's been home for like almost two weeks and spent, I think, like one afternoon with her family. Yeah. And everywhere she goes, he's very well known. And she says she has this sense of like other girls being jealous and judging her. That's his new girlfriend. I don't get it. He holds my hand while kids line up to greet him as if he's some kind of king. So, of course, she has to go back to Italy because that's where she lives and goes to school. And he doesn't want her to. He freaks out. But when she's back in Italy, she's home for, what, maybe a week going back to school? Yeah, and she's literally cut everybody off. She's just sitting on her lap, her computer all the time, waiting for Ace to log on so they can talk on AIM. And he says, if you love me, you need to get back here. And so she tells her grandpa that she needs money for an abortion. God, I, I'm sorry, but to do that to your Italian grandpa... Who's dying. I don't think an abortion is wrong, but you know he does. And you know it's going to upset him to know that you need an abortion. So to lie to him that you need an abortion... That was a lot. I will say it is so crazy the way like the fanatics have pushed the abortion conversation because to think that her like very Italian Catholic grandpa would be like, all right, like I'm not thrilled to hear it, but I will pay for it. Anyway, so she uses that money to fly back to New York. She's 16 years old, flying internationally, not telling anyone in her family what country she's in. Like hoping somebody will be there to pick her up. On the plane, my mind descends into darkness thinking about my grandpa. I'm a piece of shit. I didn't even say bye. I tell myself it's okay. I'll go visit him over the summer. I think about Barbara and Letizia and my other friends from school. They're going to be so pissed that I didn't tell them I was leaving. I think about my teachers at school who will probably call my mom. I think about Veronica. My head hurts. She gets back to New York and goes straight to essentially living with her new drug dealer boyfriend. At Trish's house. So Trish is the one, you guys might remember, who had the hoarder alcoholic mom who called the cops on them. She now lives with her dad, who is in AA. And I guess because he feels guilty for not being there for most of her life. He's kind of like, you're allowed to do whatever you want in this apartment. And he just sleeps through everything. And so Trisha's apartment is like the drug dealing den. It's where they all hang out. Pretty immediately, her relationship with Ace turns horribly violent. He grabs her at a party and slams her against a wall. Because she ran to a bodega to pick something up without telling him. Yes. She yells at him. She says, you're not a tough guy. You claim to be. You're fake and a phony. Real men don't hit girls. And he begs for forgiveness. I love you so much, he whispers. I finally met my match. He lets that one desperate laugh, tears forming in his eyes. Julia, please, I beg you, forgive me. They're just caught in this cycle of abuse where he's physically abusive. She screams at him. He apologizes and begs. And then they have sex and make up. Yeah. And so she has this return ticket to Italy tucked away that she kind of keeps as insurance. But then he finds it, shreds it, freaks out. And then he also gets a call to beat up a kid. And she's like, well, don't you have... A man sought her warrant out. Yeah. She's like, you maybe shouldn't do that. He insists on it. He goes, he beats the shit out of a kid. In front of a private school. So now he's fucking with like rich kids. They found some private school kid who was housing them for a little bit. And he's like hiring Ace as his henchman because he wants to pretend that he's like hard. You know what I mean? And so he has Ace come like almost kill one of his private school colleagues. And of course, those kids' parents are like, well, we're calling the fucking cop. Yeah. So there is another warrant out, and he's not that hard to find, but they just hide out at his mom's house for months. So Julia is on the run because she has run away from Italy 
Her school notices she's missing. There are missing posters of her all around the Upper East Side. And so Ace, to show his love for her, is like, well, I'll go collect them all for you. So he gets all the missing posters down. So they're hiding at Trisha's apartment. He's got a warrant out. He misses his court date. She is now officially a missing person because she left Italy, didn't tell anyone where she was. I think her family must know she's in New York. There's missing person posters everywhere. I think Ace is an adult. So technically, when you have a minor in your possession, it's kidnapping. He, as an act of love to her, goes and collects all the missing persons posters from around New York City. I look so ugly, I say yanking the posters out of his hand. Not only did they choose the ugliest photos of me in existence, but when I get a closer look, I notice all my identifiable information is wrong. My birth year is not 1992. I'm definitely not five feet nine, and I certainly weigh more than 110 pounds. I crumple the loose papers and shove them deep in the trash. It's embarrassing. I suddenly feel justified in running away. I did the right thing. I'm with people who care about me now. When Ace finally returns, I leap into his arms. I feel so insecure, and I need him to validate me. At one point, Ace comes up with this idea with this mob guy to sell Julia back to her own parents for $50,000. And she's like, they don't have $50,000. So she calls her dad from Star 69 and is like, I'm fine. Leave me alone. But And also, if anyone offers you reward money, don't take it. Eventually, the cops come and find out where they're holed up. Trisha's dad comes out and screams. He's like, we're the only white people here. You're going to get us killed. You can't have like the cops coming, bursting down the door in the apartment building. People are going to be so mad at us. Like Everybody has to get out. So then Ace finally goes to his last hiding spot, the only place he has left to go, which is his mom's house in the Bronx. She also feels very trapped with him at this point because he found her return ticket and ripped it up. He stole her cell phone that she uses to communicate with her friends in Italy and anyone else in the world. She doesn't know anywhere else to go. She doesn't feel that she can go home to her family. She doesn't feel that she has anywhere else besides Ace's mom's house. They are living like a hellish existence in there. They never leave the house. All they eat is fast food. I barely recognize myself. I feel like a shadow of my former self. My clothes no longer fit. My once clear complexion is now speckled with zits. When I complain, he dismisses my concern with sinister grin, telling me it's for my own good, that guys won't be attracted to me anymore, and now he can have me to himself. I no longer feel bound by passionate love, but I've threatened to leave him so many times he barely acknowledges my hollow warnings. I decide it's time to take some of my power back. So she tries to leave, and of course he attacks. His mom is just there, like, cleaning up after them and getting them take out. And being like, is everything good? And meanwhile, they all get into these like violent fights where he is rageful and violent towards her. And her mom just will come in later and be like, you okay, sweetheart? It's so weird. Ace just like rules the roost. At one point, she asks the mom for like what he was like as a kid and what the dad was like. And she starts to feel really bad for him that he had like a hard childhood. And I do think there is this thing that women have where like sympathy becomes this prison where it's almost dangerous to try to empathize with people because you can't allow them to be abusive to you. Yeah. You can feel for somebody's traumas without allowing them to hurt you. So eventually the DA gets in contact and is like, listen, you have to send Julia home. And if you do, we will not book you for kidnapping and statutory rape. But like you have to send this girl back to her family. And they say like you have to come down to the station and talk to us because there are charges. At this point, you're evading arrest. And so he goes down kind of under the impression that he'll have a little conversation. And of course, he gets booked. Like, of course, he's fully arrested and brought to Rikers. He's violently assaulted several people at this point. And so he's booked for a court date. They go to his hearing and he is being held without bail because the judge says, you fool me once, shame on me, but you can't go home. You're a violent criminal. And so she goes back to her family. He is in jail. And for a while, she is still seeing him, going to visit him, going through all the rigmarole of like getting there, going through visitation. He proposes. And then she goes to his house and finds a file on his computer full of photos and videos of him cheating on her. And she's like, never mind. He doesn't take it easily. He has a lot of people around town who are following her, who are stalking her. And she threatens to kill herself. And he calls the cops from jail and they come to check on her. Her family is in Italy right now. So she's home alone and they book her in a mental institution. And she's told it's initially a 24 hour hold. Then it becomes 72. And then because her family can't come pick her up, it's extended to about 10 days when her dad does finally come pick her up. They're like, we think she should stay longer. And her dad's like, okay, then. It's so crazy that your daughter who was just missing for three months and you thought was being kidnapped. You then are like, okay, we're going on a vacation. See you later. Yeah. I can't believe she was left alone at all. I get that she was 15 and they couldn't control her. To leave her alone after that, I mean, that's exactly how she ended up where she was. Like, that's exactly how she ended up thinking Ace was the only person that she could go home to. 
She's in this institution. Ace finds her there and he's calling nonstop. He's making it known that she can't escape him. She's having nightmares every time she hears a phone ring. Her friends are snitching to Ace. Yeah, it turns out the way that he had been able to stalk her all those times was like her old friend Trish had to log into her MySpace and was showing him conversations. All of her friends were writing him out to Ace and he was having her stalked. And that's why he was able to be like, I know what color shirt you're wearing. I know where you were today. He called every hospital in New York until he found her and he wouldn't stop calling. And he's like, you'll never escape me. And then they say they're going to drug her. And she like refuses. She's like, I'm not a guinea pig. I'm a human being. I'm not taking your drugs. But yeah, I mean, they threaten like chains, basically. They're like, we'll cuff you to this bed or you can just willingly take these drugs. She begs her dad to get her out of there. And he says, you just have to do what they say and they'll let you out. So eventually on her way out, she decides, I'm just not going to be afraid of him anymore. So when she gets out of the institution, she's like, yeah, I don't know, threaten me. I make up my mind then and there that I will no longer be afraid of him. I'm not going to let him have that over me. I'm not going to give him the power to continue ruining my life. I'm not going to open up his letters, answer his calls, or talk to any of my friends who keep tabs on me for him. I'm getting my tattoo covered as soon as I get out. I am no longer his property. When I finally get out of the hospital, my dad enrolls me in a public high school downtown and I change my cell phone number. My dad intercepts letters from Ace and hides them from me. I slowly start to feel free of Ace's grasp. I smoke so much weed and pop so many pills that I wouldn't give a fuck either way. She says, obviously, school's not doing well. She's really checked out. She mostly goes to look up free apartments in Hawaii. And she starts hanging out with a bunch of skater boys who she's like sleeping with. She's friends with them. They all tag. They smoke weed. I feel like generally they're pretty harmless. They just like to hang out at bars and do drugs and stuff. Everyone I hang out with goes by nicknames, gang names, or tag names. I realize I don't know anyone's real name, but they all know mine. Julia Fox, they yell as they ride past me on their bikes or when they see me in a crowded room. My name and my likeness quickly permeate the city when I pose semi-nude for a prominent street artist. Soon my painted body is splashed across campuses all over West Broadway. I still can't legally drink, but my image is now on display in nightclubs all over Manhattan. It even makes a cameo in a popular reality TV spinoff show at the Gansfort. So I do think she was in the downtown scene, like, unknown entity. And we talk about this later, but the name Julia Fox is, like, such a stage name. I can't believe that's her real name. Yeah. She just, like, is present and public. There's just something about her that people are drawn to. She's beautiful. And she's, like, down. And I think she's always causing a scene. Yeah. I think she is always getting into a fight outside. She is always, like, showing up to a party and stealing from you and hooking up with your friend. And she's part of every crowd. She's got the Yorkville friends. She's going out in Brooklyn. She's going out in Queens. She's going out to every club downtown and meatpacking, every bar downtown the Lower East Side. The party never seems to end. It consumes me. She becomes friends with this girl, Liana. Liana and I make the perfect team. She usually finds the party and pushes me to the front of the line so I can work my charm and get us all in. Her motto is that you can make anything fun with the right crew of people. And soon we become collectors of rejects from all walks of life. So around this time, her mom is living back in Italy. And her old friend, Veronica, is living with her mom to help take care of her baby sibling. Which is weird because Veronica was very rich. So I wonder how this even came to be. I guess Veronica just needed something to do. Yeah. Her grandfather passes away and she is not able to fly back to Italy. Her parents won't pay for the ticket on short notice because it's a higher rate. Yes. So she's not given the opportunity to go to her grandfather's funeral. And instead, Veronica attends in her place. I think the death of her grandfather kind of sends her even more on a spiral. She's partying harder than she ever has. She's doing drugs one night. She starts to do heroin for the first time. And so she is at a party with Liana and they're dealing drugs to these rich guys. And Liana is with one of the guys and she just like needs to cop. So she calls their drug dealer friend Rick and she goes to his house and he's like, I can't right now. It was 7 a.m. Yeah, he lives with his family. The mom is like, get out of here. Yeah. So she is like, I just need drugs and then I'll leave. And so Rick is like, okay, here's some drugs. And she overdoses. I come to in an ambulance with vomit all around me. Even the paramedics are covered in vomit. One of them goes through my wallet, frantically pulling out my fake IDs and holding them next to my face. Which one is you? He asks. I shake my head and pass out again. She comes to again in the hospital. Her dad is there crying and she promises to do better. I feel like I'm drowning in shame. Part of me doesn't want him to care about me. So I don't ever have to feel as guilty as I do at this very moment. For the next few months, I stopped doing hard drugs and tell everyone I'm, quote, sober, even though I still smoke tons of weed. I have perfect attendance at school. I do my homework. I participate in class. I even win a most improved award. Then Veronica moves to New York. And at first, she's so happy to have her best friend from Italy in New York. But pretty quickly, things go so sour. And it's always like this physical space thing where she has these best friends and the relationships are so intense, but then they can never get away from each other. She even talks about this with Mia, her best friend from when she was seven that they were seeing each other every night because their parents were dating. And like they would just fight like cats and dogs because there was never time for space. Yeah. So Veronica is living with her. 
she really quickly is like, I'm actually so sick of this. Veronica is assuming her mannerisms, like borrowing her clothes, kind of becoming her. And they had a bed bug infestation in their apartment right before Veronica got there. So all there is is like a blow up mattress on the floor in the living room that they're sharing. And then Veronica starts dating her dad. She doesn't ever explicitly say, but she is. The dad and Veronica keep going on walks together. And Julia is obviously fucking pissed. And she's like, she has to get out of here. She has to get out of here. It's me or her. And the dad just hands her $400. And so she's like, oh, so her. So she moves in with Liana and her mom, Dina, downtown. Dina is also a hoarder. Even worse hoarder than my dad. Everywhere there are piles of useless junk that she claims to be valuable. And she just starts throwing stuff out. Every time they're out of the house, she just like cleans up and gets rid of junk. And she says every time they come back, they're like, the place looks great. And she's like, okay, I just don't have to tell them what I'm doing. Yeah. She says at one point she opens up a 10-year-old lunchbox and there just like is a banana in it. So her and Liana, they start telling everyone they're sisters. It doesn't feel like we're lying. It feels as if we were sisters in a past life. I feel like I've known her since the beginning of time. She radiates power and confidence. It's my favorite thing about her. I wish I could be more like that. And this is a theme that comes up throughout the book a lot is how insecure she is, which we actually talk about this with her in the interview that we did because it was very shocking to me because I've always viewed her as this like beacon of confidence, especially when you think about the fact that she was a 16-year-old downtown celebrity Like, how do you have the confidence to put yourself out there like that? And she says it's like a lack of confidence, but I find it really interesting the way insecurity plays a role in all the choices that she's made that other people would probably view as the exact opposite. In order to get Veronica out of her house, because again, she tried to do the her or me thing. Now she's kicked out of her home. So she tries to call immigration to get Veronica deported and that doesn't work. And so then she calls her mom. She's like, mom, dad's living with Veronica. And so her mom gets Veronica out. And she's like, I'm relieved Veronica's not there, but it tarnished our reputation because my dad chose her over me. And she's not back in Italy. So she's like, I know she's still in New York and I know they're still seeing each other. And her dad has this boat. And she realizes Veronica's obviously living on the boat. She goes, she is. And she realizes she can never beat Veronica because Veronica like took the one thing that she's always wanted. And that's to like be cared for by her dad. I'll never forget my dad and I'll never be able to go home again. And I'm so embarrassed. Everyone knows about it. The boys in my neighborhood and my so-called friends crack jokes at my expense. I laugh along so as not to cry. And then her grandma dies. Her father's mother dies. And when he calls and says that, as the funeral approaches, I warn my dad that I won't be attending if Veronica is there. I'm still livid that she got to attend my grandpa's funeral in Italy when I was never even given the option. When my dad hangs up on me, I know that he has decided for us. He's going with her. If I hated him before, now I absolutely despise him. I wish he were the one who died in my grandmother's place. So she is still stealing pretty regularly. Her and Liana would go downtown and they would just steal purses and steal stuff out of them. And one day they're at a club and they steal a purse and then their table gets surrounded. And it turns out the woman whose purse they stole is a DA. She says, you bitches fucked with the wrong one. (laughs) And because they had stolen her wallet and they both had fake IDs on them, they're booked for not just like grand larceny, but identity theft. Yes. So she gets sent to central booking. They're there for 16 hours. She like oversleeps her sentencing and like shows up in a party dress from the night before. She really isn't taking it seriously at all. The reason she's late to her court date is the night before her and her friend Serena has just been walking around or like biking around. And some guys in a car are like, you guys smoke, drink, you party. You want to come in our car? We'll drive you around. And they just go, okay, why not? And I'm like, when men call at me from cars, they don't anymore. But back when I was youthful, And I'd always be like, has this ever worked on anyone? I'm like, I can't believe it worked on Julia Fox. When I'm out here being like, what girl is just getting in some strange cat caller's car? Not only is it a girl, but it's a top girl. I didn't know that there was any success rate on that thing. And now I get the motivation. You call out at every girl you've ever seen on your life in the street. You may go home with Julia Fox that night. So she goes home with these guys. She oversleeps her sentencing. She gets to court and she is told that she has to finish high school, get a real job, stay sober, and she's on probation. But she is not sentenced to jail. However, if she violates any of these terms, it is a mandatory year in prison. And so now she's like, wait, this might actually be serious because I don't want to go to jail for a year. She goes to this like school that Liana had graduated from that was like a school for people who'd been kicked out of every other school. And she feels comfortable there, which is good. And she feels ready to finish school. She's still doing hard drugs. She's like, I can't smoke weed anymore because that stays in your system for 30 to 60 days, right? But hard drugs are a lot of times out of your system in a couple of hours, like 72 hours. So she's still doing heroin, even though she has to stay sober as a point on her parole. She's also doing heroin secretly. Liana has this like one line that the rule, you can't cross the heroin line. That's too far. She's like, heroin is not chic. 
And she tries not to do it, but she just keeps getting hooked back on it. Obviously, it's highly addictive. And one night she's at a party at Liana's house. And when Liana sees that she's doing heroin, she goes, get the fuck out now. This is not okay. You cannot bring heroin into our home. I deadass won't be your friend anymore. She waves her authoritative finger in my face and I nod, keeping my gaze to the floor. The thought of Liana not speaking to me is too much to bear. I drag my feet to the bathroom and empty the rest of the brown powder into the toilet. She flushes it and stomps out of the bathroom as I watch my only reprieve circling the drain. So she needs to get a job that actually gives her money because I guess she's only had these pretty minimum wage jobs. And also she had always just been stealing from her dad. I feel like her dad was broke, but I guess never so broke that when she had his credit card number, she couldn't pay for stuff. And I guess if you're living someone's house for free. Her expenses were low. So she sees a job on Craigslist, dominatrix dungeon, no sex, no nudity, no experience necessary. And she's like, well, my friend's sister did that all those years ago. And I thought it was so cool. So she applies for the job. And she meets a guy in a coffee shop and he's like, wow, you're very beautiful. Come on down to the dungeon. He's like, I can't believe you're real. And she's like, I can't believe you're real. Her friends are like, it's a scam. They're not really going to pay you that money. And she's like, no, I already met him in a coffee shop. It's legit. It's so funny. It makes you wonder what the word scam would even mean. Yeah. She met a man in a leather trench coat at a coffee shop and she was like, this is the safest thing I've ever done. (laughs) So she goes down to the dungeon. She gets changed for her first day. Everyone makes fun of her because she doesn't look classy. And then she goes to the costume room and she's like, oh, you dress in more latex than I was wearing before. I was wearing cotton corsets. (laughs) And her first client is called Smoking Stewart. But my friends call me Stu. And his thing is that he likes having smoke smoked into like a funnel into his mouth. And so she's chain smoking for just hours and hours. And finally, she can't do it anymore because her mouth hurts. And so she tries to just chat with him. She finds out that Stuart like loves gay porn. And she's like, oh, he's secretly gay. I'm going to dom him about being gay. Yeah. And he loves that. And then he's forever her client. She goes, I feel a strange sense of triumph and pride. I know what he wants. I realize that part of this job is reading between the lines. I have to know what they want before they've even come to terms with it. I understand the secret to this trade. I become a jack of all trades. Adapting quickly is the nature of the job. If a client wants electrical play, suddenly I'm a master electrician. If he wants piercing, suddenly I'm the most experienced piercer there ever was. I never turn down a job and I revel in the fact that I can be anyone at any given moment. I transform into your mean mommy and evil nun, the bitchy popular girl in high school. It's all in a day's work. My strong intuition and excellent improvisational skills keep the job interesting and the money rolling in. I'm becoming increasingly popular at the dungeon, often booked back to back while some of the girls sit around for entire days without a session. It's impressive considering I'm only 18 and the youngest girl to ever work here. So there's another girl who is kind of the leader and terrorizes the other girls and she pees on Julia's stuff. So Julia also soils her belongings. Yeah, I think she like shits in a bag and then like funnels it through her locker. Yeah, it's a lot, but it kind of quiets this girl. And then suddenly the dungeon is a lot more fun because the girls feel a lot more free now that they're out of the tyranny of this other dominatrix who'd been torturing them emotionally. After about six months, she's not liking it anymore. She's like, it's actually exhausting to become a new person every day to like fulfill the fantasies of these men. She also sees that everyone else there has been there forever. And she goes, I make a promise to myself at that moment that I won't get trapped in this lifestyle like so many before me. I'm going to make something of myself and I'm going to show them. I feel drained. I feel depleted. I'm burnt out. I even tell one of my clients he should go to therapy to unpack the trauma with his mom. My soul can't handle it anymore. With my probation officer at my ass, I can't even smoke a blunt to relax. So she is praying for a sugar daddy because she's heard that there are some girls who only last a couple of months because some guy will come into the dungeon and meet them and then want to get them out of there, want to save them and just like give them a lot of money. So one night her and Liana are out and she decides she wants acid. So she calls a dealer that a friend gave her the number of. And he comes through in a snowstorm and she's like, do you want to hang out for a little bit? Because you are soaking and freezing from a snowstorm. And he's like, for sure. But he says he's sober and he doesn't want to do drugs with her. He's on methadone to help him with his heroin addiction. Yes. And so she gives him some Vicodin. He relapses and she feels really bad. But I will say he shouldn't have taken the Vicodin. Yeah, but she does it because she finds out that he had like an ex-girlfriend who like did porn and was older and she was scared he wasn't going to call her. She's like, why don't you come over? I have Vicodin. And then when he stops returning her calls, she's like, hey, I have heroin. Do you want to come over? And he runs over and they like relapse together. And she ODs and someone has to save her with Narcan. Yeah. Also, he is the first person she shoots up with. She asks him to teach her. And he just like leaves her at someone's doorstep. He was going to leave her to die in her apartment, but decides that before he runs away, he'll like knock on a neighbor's door and be like, someone save her. And they save her with Narcan. 
And he stole a lot of her jewelry on the way out. Yeah. Including a bracelet she got when she was born. Liana is the only one who seems to care. She calls my mom pleading with her to save me. She's your daughter and she's going to die. She screams on the phone. But I know my mom all too well. I'm not surprised when she hangs up on Liana. That's devastating. So she decides it's going to be her last day as a dominatrix. She gets one final outgoing call, which is when you go and meet them. She'd never done them before, but she heard there's a ton of money to be made. So she goes to meet this guy in his hotel. He's staying in a really fancy hotel room. And his name is Rohan. And he just like wants to hang out. They like eat fancy food and chill. And basically, he's like, my ex-girlfriend was a dominatrix. And she's like, oh, so you're looking for a new version of her. And this, it turns out, is kind of his pattern. Is he likes to clean up a rough around the edges girl. But he's like, so what are you going to do now that you're not a dominatrix anymore? And she's like, I don't know yet. And he's like, well, here's $7,000 while you figure it out. And she never cashes the check. And he goes on vacation or something. And he comes back. And she's like, the thing is, I didn't want him to think it was just about the money. I really liked him. I enjoyed talking to him. I found him attractive. And so he gets her an apartment. And he gives her $10,000 cash. Yeah. Rohan and I text sporadically in his absence at the beginning and then gradually less and less. I graduate high school and celebrate by getting high. I complete my drug program with my dad's help. He's peeing in cups for her. And I only have to report to my probation officer once a month just to scan my hand. She spirals because now she feels like a little bit less handcuffed by the system. And she is just like partying and having sex. And she thinks she might have had a miscarriage in a random toilet on the Lower East Side. Rohan comes back and they're back to chatting all the time. Am I your girlfriend? I ask him, slurring my words. He pauses. I would love that. He says, I'm constantly blown away by Rohan's kindness, but I also feel guilty for hiding my addiction from him. He doesn't seem to notice, or maybe he chooses to ignore it. Whatever the case might be, I can't understand what this good man sees in me. He's like a guardian angel to me. His energy is so intense that I feel his presence even when he's not around. It's like I can feel him thinking about me. They haven't had sex because she's afraid that if they do, he'll lose interest. Also, at this point, Liana starts going to AA meetings and is really interested in sobriety. I don't know if she's like fully sober, but she is into the idea of it. She tries to get Julia to come with, but Julia is not ready. She is like fully a heroin addict at this point. On her 20th birthday, she goes out with Rohan. And when she goes back to the apartment, her friends have all thrown her a surprise party. And she's so mad they're there because all she wants to do is shoot up alone. I feel like I've been soaring through an infinite abyss for so long and I finally see a glimmer of hope. On her birthday, she passes out and overdoses again. Liana makes her go to a meeting with her for Alcoholics Anonymous and somebody says, drugs will give you wings to fly, but it'll take away the sky. So she's still seeing Rohan pretty regularly. He's paying her rent and for her birthday, he gets her a Mercedes. He exposes us to a world of luxury and culture, inviting us to the opera, the ballet and front row seats for shows like The Book of Mormon and Charlie Sheen's drug-fueled theatrical debut. He jokes that he got three for the price of one because he is supporting Julia, Liana, and their other friend. They all live in this $10,000 a month Soho apartment that he pays for. His nickname for me is Poupe. It's French for doll, and I'm starting to feel just like that, a doll he can dress and play with, or a caged animal, but the cage is platinum and encrusted with diamonds, and nobody feels any sympathy when I complain about it. He starts becoming needy and possessive, and I live in constant fear that he'll take everything away from us. It's a different kind of fear than I felt with Ace, a different kind of possessiveness, but no less damaging. I begin to feel trapped and dependent on him for everything. My friends depend on him now, too, and the pressure overwhelms me. He gives me just enough money to keep me asking for more, and I've completely adapted to the new lifestyle as his princess. Without telling Rohan, I throw myself a party at my apartment, and a bunch of old friends come over, among them a guy named Shane. I've known him for a few years and dated one of his friends, but was always under the impression that he hated me, so I'm surprised to see him on the roof of our duplex. They start chatting and having fun, and they're up all night, and of course, they eventually have sex. He says, what's the deal with your sugar daddy? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And she goes, it's not like that. He doesn't fuck me and leave me money on the nightstand. He actually loves me. Isn't he married? I let go of him and turn over my back. For what it's worth, I think it's pretty cool that this billionaire guy is like in love with you and does so much for you. I think it's fucking badass. Yeah, and that's why he will always come first, I warn him. That's fine. I won't fuck it up for you. And he does fuck it up. So she's also sober at this point. We forgot to say. After that birthday party thing. Yeah. And Rohan at first is upset about it, but then he gets to know the real her, and she's like, I can't believe he really likes me. Shane becomes my new addiction. I pour all my time and money into him. He works odd jobs, and I allow him to crash at our place for weeks until our fights become so explosive that he disappears for a few days. Anytime her friends try to like have an intervention with her about him, she's like, you don't know the pressure I'm under. You all live off of me. Without me, you'd have nothing. Like I'm under control. I've got it. Don't worry. I choose drama over sobriety. I stop going to AA meetings and I focus all my free time on Shane. At this point, Rohan is paying for them to have a fashion line that Liana runs. Yeah, they're supposed to run it together, but she's so obsessed with Shane that like she just leaves all the work to Liana. 
I start drinking again. I rationalize my behavior by telling myself that as long as I'm not doing heroin, I'm doing great. I started coming to the realization that there's something wrong with this. It can't be normal to feel everything at such an elevated state. I see how people compartmentalize their lives and allowing the drama to envelop the rest of them. I begin to wonder why I can't seem to do the same. She starts like playing it pretty fast and loose with this whole Rohan and Shane thing. Rohan has a house in the Hamptons that she's supposed to spend the summer at. She invites Shane for the day when Rohan is supposed to be back in the city for the day. And of course, he comes home early. And she's like, this is my gay hairdresser. And he's like, that guy is not gay. But she cuts it off and is like, I have to be loyal to Rohan. The next few weeks, I'm on my best behavior. I stop seeing Shane. I finish probation. I graduate from community college and I'm accepted as a student at the new school. I focus on the fashion line. If I can make some money on my own, then I won't be tethered to Rohan anymore. So their fashion line stops doing, I'm not stops doing well. It never was doing that well. It's hard to turn a fashion line profitable. And so she freaks out and starts seeing Shane again. She empties her savings to invest in a club that he's opening. She gives him $25,000. And of course, this puts her back in contact with him. And again, she's like going out to dinner with Rohan and then rushing to the opening of Shane's club because she wants to be there for him. When she gets to Shane's club, he won't even speak to her. He's surrounded by models and they're all like, we want you to leave. Things with Rohan have, because she leaves to go be with Shane and he's pretty aware of that. He's like, okay, well, this is over. And she goes in and demands that he keep paying her rent. And what else? Paying for the fashion line and giving them an allowance. She says she needs spousal support. She gave him five years of her life and he needs to keep her. Yeah. And he's like, no. And she's like, well, I'll make your life a living hell. And he's like, okay, then. And so he just does. He gets a new girlfriend who's another like young dominatrix, basically. And this is his pattern. But I mean, she's got the bills paid. Shane is physically abusive and choosing him over Rohan leads to now like a much more tumultuous relationship because she's able to fully throw herself into it. Whereas before she was walking a line between the two of them and now her and Shane are in this absolutely volatile relationship. At one point, he punches her in the face and then they just get back together. When they're broken up, he's dating models and all these girls to make her jealous. So she goes out with a famous actor unnamed and brings him to the club that she's an investor in, that she's always hanging out at with her friends to make him jealous because he is a fame whore and will be so jealous of her making out with a celebrity. He puts her in a headlock. She goes home and her friend Liana is like, things are going bad, like you need help. She's begging her to get help and she goes, you have fish in your bathtub and you think someone made a voodoo doll of you. Her chin quivers as she pleads with me, desperately trying to convince me that I am losing my mind. I look around my room with a sense of detachment. I rearrange my furniture so many times a week I barely recognize it. And there are, in fact, a dozen large freshwater fish in my bathtub. She's right. This is bad. So she finally goes to a psychiatrist and she gets prescribed mood stabilizers, which I think maybe help a little. So after this big altercation with Shane at the club, where he puts her in a headlock in front of people and breaks her phone, she tries to stay calm with him the next day and is like, well, you owe me a new phone. And he comes in, disrespectful, gives her a broken phone out of the lost and found at the club. And she freaks out and presses charges. And this like divides their community. So their entire downtown community is aware of the drama between them. Everyone's picking sides. Someone leaks her old dominatrix photos on an Instagram account and follows all of her friends, all of her colleagues. At this point, she still has a fashion line. And she's trying to put her past behind her. She does not want to be known as a sex worker. And so she's pissed that now she's been banned from the club that she is an investor in because they take Shane's side, essentially. She goes through this experience that is obviously quite heightened, but I think a lot of women have had this experience where they come out against an abuser and you are forced to either prove yourself or people just say, no, I simply don't believe you. And they take the side of the abuser and you're blacklisted because now you have a problem with him. It's not that he caused a problem with you. So she feels thrust out of her community. And they're like blackmailing her. They're sharing all this information about her. I decide I'm going to take control of the narrative and beat them to the punch. I will put together a book about my life. For the title, I take a line from one of the club owner's public statements about the assault. He said that our squabble was symptomatic of a relationship gone sour. I wonder what the name was. I think maybe symptomatic of a relationship gone sour. That's a cool name. But I also think you could shorten it to like relationship gone sour or even just gone sour. Or sour. Famously, Olivia Rodrigo would name her own album. Anyway, so she basically flees town. She and a friend named Harmony decide to get the hell out of here. And they go on just a series of road trips. They end up living in the bayou in Louisiana for months at a time. And she's taking all these photos. And a friend of hers is like, hey, when you get back to New York, I'd love to do a gallery show with these photos you've been posting. They're so good. So there is this nonstop pull where like, no matter what she does, 
people are into it. People are obsessed with it. Also, when her dominatrix photos get revealed, she's still doing this fashion line with her friend Liana. And they do this spread for ID Magazine where Julia ties up her friend Liana and they do this whole editorial shoot in the style of a dominatrix thing. And they like do an article about online bullying and it becomes this whole moment. She's constantly reclaiming the narrative as people try to publicly humiliate her. She also poses in Playboy. But she's also like changing. Liana calls her up at one point and is like, this billionaire is going to fly us down to Miami. In Miami, she's just like, I'm different. I don't know. This just isn't fun for me anymore. Also in Miami, she like takes a sip of something and blacks out and wakes up and she has no idea what happened. But she's like, I just know that he assaulted me. Like, I feel very violated. I don't understand how I blacked out for hours. But she's like, I know I can't press charges because I've already tried that and nobody will believe me. They just keep going back to the bayou and she has these two friends down there, these two gay friends, her, Harmony, Mike and Eric. They're just like down there doing drugs on the bayou, living kind of this like fake life where they do arts and crafts all day and they're all on pills and she feels like it's a family, but it's also pretty fucked up. They also keep going to New Orleans and like they're hanging out in trap houses and she ODs again and Harmony has to slap her to wake her up. Like it's just this monotonous cycle of horror. And so then she's back in New York. So she has this art show in New York and it really is incredible because I think so many people would die to have an art show in New York and her friend just was like, I have an idea. Why don't you bring up your photos? And at first she's like, no. And then she agrees to do it and they set it all up. And she says, the little gremlin voice inside my head tells me no one will come. No one will show up for me. Everybody hates me. Which is like crazy because literally somebody begged her to do this. People show up. It's packed. I feel a brief sense of accomplishment. I know I should be happy, but I'm not. I still hear the nagging voices in my head. I call my old dealer and we proceed to lock ourselves in my bedroom and get high for the rest of the night. It's the only way that I can feel calm. Harmony is kind of trying to get her life together and decides she wants to be a filmmaker. So she gets into UCLA for filmmaking, which is a really fucking big deal. Yeah. But now that she's out in LA, Julia's completely alone. She's just driving around the desert in Arizona, like meeting people in trailer parks, stripping here and there to make money. It's the longest I've been single and I've never been alone for this long. I'm just now getting to know myself. So she finally goes back to New York and Eric asks her to drive him some drugs in Michigan. So she's driving across the border with a lot of drugs on her. And she gets pulled over for like a traffic violation. And so she prays and says, like, please, if you let me get out of this, I'll get sober. She does get out of it. She goes back to New York and she starts going to meetings. And in a meeting, she meets Gianna, who becomes her new attached at the hip best friend. They end up partying together. She relapses pretty quickly. And then she does another art installation called R.I.P. Julia Fox, where she has like a living funeral featuring all of her art. She sells her books some more. I would love to get my hands on that early art book. When a journalist asks, what does R.I.P. Julia Fox mean to you? I tell her, this chapter of my life is over. She's dead. It's an ending, but it's really a new beginning. And that's when we get into Uncut Gems. So now we are at the audition. Josh Sadby, a friend of hers, or Safdie, however you say his name. I don't know, man. Has been calling her. They've been working on the script together. She's been really rewriting the character that she ends up playing. So much so that they even rename it Julia. That was not originally the character's name. Well, part of that is because Adam Sandler's daughter is named Sadie, and that was the original character's name. And he's like, I'm not going to have an affair with a character named Sadie. <laughs> but anyway, they were like, we wrote this role with you in mind specifically. And she gives a screen test. And they're like, you're incredible. But it's a big budget movie. And they want us to go with a star, like a Lady Gaga or a Jennifer Lawrence. And so she wants it to happen, but she doesn't have any hope. It feels like this is my destiny, but I'm so afraid to be wrong. I'm so afraid of not being chosen. I put all of myself into this character. The belief in my destiny begins to change and the lens through which I view myself grows hazy and distorted, causing me to conclude that girls like me don't get opportunities like this. I find this so interesting because I feel like a girl like her is who gets, like she is just like this it girl who kind of floated to the top. I mean, there's 10,000 girls in LA right now dying to audition for roles like this and she's just spent her last seven months on the bayou doing Oxy. Yeah. Why would it be her at all? <laughs> like she really is somebody that it happens to. So she gets the job, obviously. And she and Gianna have both relapsed. She brings Gianna to the set with her and they spend the entire first half of filming just fucked up the entire time. She's getting in fights with her friends and like crying all night and then showing up to film and like doing a good job because that's kind of what the character is. And then her friend passes away and she's like, fuck, I have to stop doing drugs. So she stops doing drugs for the rest of the shoot. At the wrap party for Uncut Gems, she meets a guy named Andrew who she marries two months later. And Gianna and Andrew don't get along at all. And it puts quite a rift between them. Over time, they start to warm up. But like things are not good. I like to also point out at this time, she still had that apartment in Soho. Yeah. So Gianna had been with her all throughout Uncut Gems. They had been best friends. Like she had been keeping her together, helping her with her lines. 
But she also says, there's always this underlying layer of darkness beneath a thin veil of glory. Gianna and I are drug addicts. The night before the first day of filming, I get sick from some bad pills and throw up all over. When the press tour for Uncut Gems kicks off that summer, Gianna is no longer my plus one. In her place come my manager, my publicist, and my now husband. I know this bothers her as she was with me the entire time while filming, but she doesn't mention it. She is an acceptance. She's resilient. So, of course, Uncut Jumps comes out and it's like this huge hit. It's something like this cool indie hit. I wouldn't say it's like a mainstream hit, but it's definitely like a cool indie hit. Yeah. I think there's like Oscar buzz around it. And she is in LA about to do a cover shoot for Wonderland when she gets a call that Gianna overdosed. She didn't make it. She goes back and she looks at their text. She looks at everything they've said to each other. I mean, there's all these what ifs. What if I was there? What if I'd called her sooner? What if I hadn't married Andrew? She was with me in LA. But I mean, you can't do that to yourself. And she starts thinking that maybe she should go back to AA and find another Gianna. Like it sends her to a really dark place. The pain of her death takes a huge toll on my marriage. I push Andrew away completely, lashing out at him and blaming him for her death. I can't shake the feeling that if I hadn't fallen in love with him, I probably would have been with her that night and maybe even been able to save her. She goes to a psychic who says she'll always be with her. I'll be okay, but I'll certainly never be the same. I decide I will never touch another opiate again for as long as I live. I've broken this promise many times before, but this time it feels different. I'm not fucking around anymore. And this time I think she, as far as we know, did. She moves to LA. Harmony's helping her unbox her stuff. I'm still heartbroken over the demise of my marriage. I feel like a failure, like it's my fault that Andrew filed for divorce. When the pandemic strikes and everything shuts down, I realize pretty quickly that I'm going to have to put my acting pursuits on pause for the foreseeable future. The gaping hole in my soul where Gianna used to be in my grief over the apparent end of my marriage is only exacerbated by this professional hiatus. So she gives Andrew a call. She has a one-way ticket back to New York. They go right back into their pattern of intense love and extreme rage paired with crushing silence and lingering pairing. And she says, and then we realized that like we didn't actually love each other as much as we thought we liked each other. It wasn't really there. But she is pregnant. She tells him and he seems neutral. Why isn't he happy? He's been telling me since we first met that he wanted to have a baby with me. The relationship remains pretty volatile. She and Liana have had some distance between them. There's no one really there for her during this pregnancy. It Plus it's the pandemic. So she's literally isolated as we all were. And she was going to terminate the pregnancy, but then she finds out the due date is February 6th, Gianna's birthday. It's like a lightning bolt strikes through the screen. And she says, it is like, she'll always be with me. So she has this baby. She's overcome with loving motherhood. Her and Liana reconnect. When she's six months pregnant, she does a Soderbergh film called No Sudden Move. She didn't tell them that she was pregnant. And I guess recently she talked to some people from the set and they were like, well, we knew you were pregnant. Anyway, so... Andrew is a horrible partner. He like stays out late. He gets drunk a lot. He doesn't help her with anything. She feels like she's parenting the baby and him. And so eventually she's like, you have to leave. We can't do this. He's horrible. He says, good luck. Who would want to date a single mom with a baby? I hang up on him before I say something I'll regret later. Her dad comes back into her life pretty well and is like really there for being a grandpa. So that's really helpful. I think to have him there and like stepping up really takes a lot of the weight off. Since becoming a mom, I have a lot more sympathy for my dad. I give him the grace to allow him to show up and he's obsessed with being a grandpa. This is the best thing to happen to me in the past 20 years, he says, beaming. And she also thinks a lot about what to do with Andrew. She says, I'm so scared of being a single mom, but then it dawns on me that I've been a single mom in this relationship for years. I already am a single mom. He does nothing for us. I've always been on his team, but he's never been on mine. And I can't keep wasting my time begging him to be someone he's not. He's shown me who he is. And this is the time to do something about it. So Andrew kind of disappears. And then he'll like talk shit about her and be like, she's keeping me from my kid. But he blocks her on everything. And she's like, well, I'm not keeping you from anyone. You blocked me. And she's home like full time taking care of this baby, stressing about money. It's the middle of the pandemic. And she just keeps hearing about all the parties he's going to and all the girls he's dating. And she fucking loses it and decides to go on like a rampage on Instagram. For those of you who don't remember, she posted, like, have you seen this deadbeat dad? She posted a lot about their stuff. And later she kind of retracted it and said, like, sorry for losing my temper. But it does feel like it was pretty justified. And then she prays for a miracle and a friend reaches out and is like, hey, my very famous friend wants to date you. And she's like, I don't know. And then they're like, he wants to fly you to Miami for New Year's. And she's like, I have plans with my friends on New Year's. And he's like, well, your friends can come. And she's like, all right, I'll get a babysitter for the night. And she flies out to Miami to date this artist. We talk on the phone for hours. Well, he talks for hours and I mostly listen, occasionally chiming in. Guess the artist. (laughs) She says she's so nervous. Like, what if he doesn't like me? Suddenly I spot him leaning against the railing of a mezzanine. His gaze fixed on me. Our eyes lock and a jolt of electricity runs through me. The crowd parts. 
clearing the path. I make my way up the stairs, my heart pounding with anticipation. My moment is abruptly stunted by another argumentative bouncer. I point to the artist and he makes his way towards us. Without saying a word, the artist extends his hand and pulls me close. Our bodies press against each other. He holds me tight. My lips press gently to his neck. And I know that this is the beginning of something truly special. I mean, she says they were drawn together like magnets. Like they had this intoxicating pull between them. She loved hearing him talk. She loved the attention of like this larger than life figure putting all of his attention on her. But it was very short lived. I think that it remains much bigger culturally than it is in her actual life. I mean, it did help to launch her. Yeah. So later they ended up at a famous rapper's house on Star Island. Is that P. Diddy? Probably. So even though we're trying to play it cool and contain our excitement, we are actually freaking out. She says immediately she gets separated from her friends and her friends are like made to stand at the door and she has to keep being like, can you go get my friends? They're dancing together at the party and his friend pulls him aside and whispers into her ear, you're doing entirely way too much. You need to chill out. She says it makes her so insecure. She looks around and there's just walls of beautiful women with BBLs happily fading into the background to be chosen next and like do what they're supposed to. She just leaves. She's like, I don't want to do this. She grabs her friends and she's like, we got to get out of here. And she does like feel very insecure about the way his friends are insistent that she become the ornament that he's looking for. And he sends her all of these clothes at first. And I think in an attempt to be like, listen, I'm not here for the clothes. She wears her own to dinner. And he like makes her change. After he spends an hour adjusting the table, he says to her, would you want to be my girlfriend? And then immediately he's like, well, how would you feel about taking our relationship public? I shut the idea down. I think we should wait a few weeks. It just feels really fast to take us such a big step now. And then the next day it leaks. And she's like, oh, he leaked it. So he wants her to get a stylist. And she's like, whoa, this is like exactly when he did this in Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So she luckily is like, well, my two best friends, Leanna and this girl, Tammy, are my stylist. Can we hire them? And he agrees and tells her management team, this is who's styling her from now on. Meanwhile, they had previously nixed the idea because they said they were too editorial. And so she's like, kind of happy with it. She's like, well, he helped me get what I want anyway, so I'll go along with it. And then she shows up and she goes back to her own apartment and her friends have been tasked with throwing out all of her clothes a la Keeping Up with the Kardashians, that scene where they're going through her closet and she keeps trying to like steal stuff back. But he has sent over racks and racks of designer goods. Yeah. A part of me feels like a show monkey, but I've been performing my whole life. So what's the big deal? When they go to see Slave Play and then go to Carbone, her friend Tammy texts her and says, come to the bathroom. And there she has a rack of clothes in the bathroom at Carbone. And she's like, oh, I guess he hated my outfit and told my friend, like, you have to change her right now. At one point, he says, I'll get you a boob job if you want. The artist's words cut through the air, sharp and unexpected. I look at myself in the mirror, taking in my post-baby body. They're not so bad, I think to myself. I convince myself that over time, if he just stops to listen to me, he might fall for me and I can help him overcome his demons. I'm often so immersed in thought that I forget to eat. I'm spread so thin between my son and the demands of the artist that I don't have any time to enjoy it. So that article that came out in Interview Magazine, do you guys remember that? Where there's all these photos that Kanye took. He took those photos privately and then he's like, yeah, I sent them to Mel. He wants you to write something about how we met. So she writes how they met. And he's like, no, that doesn't work. How about this? And she's like, this sounds crazy. And it turns out his friend that she doesn't like wrote it. Also, he sends an NDA over and she's like, absolutely not. But all her friends sign it. And so I think it was just a clerical error on Kanye's team's part that they assumed everybody had signed one. Yeah. Because they don't realize till later that he's like, wait, you never signed your NDA. And she refuses. And she says there were like really wonderful moments. Like at one point he had to drive her to the airport in Los Angeles. And they were just like speeding down the 405, like screaming his songs. And her rented Dodge Charger. Yeah. But then he also is, you know, of course, quite volatile. He says Tammy and Liana actually are not doing a good job styling her and he wants to fire them. He like wants to strip away every part of her life that is hers. He says that they shouldn't be riding the same car as them. He doesn't like that she got her makeup done in his hotel room. Like all these little things. Yes, she goes in for a photo shoot. Harmony Corinne is shooting her and she like feels a piece of her tooth crack off. And she's like, okay, I am falling to bits. This can't go on. Also, he had stopped talking to her for a few days. And when he texts her, she's like, yeah, I'm doing the Supreme shoot. And he's like, I hate your outfit. Why did you wear that? You're not allowed to wear that. And she's like, well, I would have run it by you if you had been answering me. Yeah, he comes to New York for her birthday and, you know, the famous Birkin bag scene where he gives her friends Birkin bags. And she says it felt more like a farewell gift than a birthday present. Also, his team kept taking quote unquote paparazzi photos of them accepting the bags and they made him do it over and over again to get the shot that Kanye's team wanted. So she has her birthday party. She says it was so fun. But then Kanye was like, we have to leave. We have to go to a different party. And so she goes with him and regrets it enormously. And this is not the first time in this book that she like leaves 
where her friends are to be with the guy that she's seeing because she just feels so strongly. Like she becomes so enmeshed in these situations. And I feel like her brain is conscious that she wants to maintain who she is, but she like is so powerless to like give herself over to these situations. I mean, she is put in situations that I think most people would have a hard time saying no to. And then she does ultimately say no. Yeah. You know, I mean, you walk into a hotel room that you've been privately flown to and that's filled with every designer outfit and your best friends are hired now to put you in fancy clothes. You're like, okay. She like walks out of that party and he doesn't really care. She doesn't hear from him for a few days. And then he calls and says, if you loved me, you would support me. And she says, who's supporting me? They get into a huge fight because he goes, I didn't know you were a drug addict. And she goes, yeah, I told you all the time. You just don't listen. I feel like I'm simultaneously living my wildest dream and trapped in my worst nightmare. She finds out that her friend Chris, who supported her through Gianna's passing, has died. And then shortly after she finds out Harmony, her friend has also died. At this point, she's not with Kanye, but she's still in the wave of the publicity that came from it. She's also doing a lot of fashion shoots, which she'd always been told not to do. She's asked to open the Laquan Smith show. And previously, her team had been like, actors don't do fashion shows unless it's like high fashion. And she's just like, fuck it. I'm just going to do whatever it is that I want to do. I want to do this. I love this work. She gets another call from Kanye's team to be like, you have to sign the NDA. And she's like, no. Tammy and Liana stay with Kanye, though. They stay on his team styling his new girlfriend. And she's like, I cannot believe that my friends of fucking decades would abandon me for a man like this. But then they come to Harmony's funeral and she sends them like a pretty scathing text. And Liana quits Kanye's team immediately. But Tammy stays on. So she like blocks Tammy. And I don't think they've spoken since. She becomes obsessed with Harmony's death, thinking that there was like a murder, that she needs to find the drug dealer who sent her the drugs. It wasn't just a regular OD. But she's told that the DA most likely won't pick up the case. I guess I'll have to get the justice myself. She starts shooting another movie. And she really comes to terms with the fact that she is famous, even though she doesn't claim the title. She says, I'm an artist in the role of a lifetime playing me. And nothing about my life has changed. I don't go clubbing. I don't go to parties. Getting dolled up and being snapped by my paparazzi friend is my only thrill. She starts to feel discouraged because she feels like she's getting blacklisted because first Kim was blacklisting her when she was dating Kanye. Now Kanye's blacklisting her like she has both sides of this very powerful couple mad at her. And she's like, why is it always an uphill battle? But again, I think she's battled herself into a pretty phenomenal position. Yeah, like it is an uphill battle, but there have also been these jumps. Do you know what I mean? Being purposefully excluded from the conversation when I single-handedly started every trend of 2022 is annoying, but my fans quiet the gremlin noises in my head. In every interview, I'm asked the same questions over and over. All they want is their next viral soundbite, and none of them ask me how I'm doing after so much loss. I don't want men to like me anymore. I'm over it. I'm reclaiming my body and rejecting the notion that I only exist to be visually pleasing. And she and Andrew reconnect. He's finally being a present father, and she realizes like he was not the man for me, but he is a good father for my son. And so it seems like they're co-parenting very well. As much as I resent Andrew, Valentino needs his dad. And she talks about how crazy it is just to like have the city plastered in her Supreme ads. She tells a story about how when she was little, she got banned from Bloomingdale's for shoplifting. And then when she was in her 20s, she hid in the Bloomingdale's and would use it to like avoid the private investigators that her rich boyfriend used to stalk her and like her ace boyfriend used to stalk her that she would use the Bloomingdale's because that had so many entrances and exit to hide and escape. And then she did an entire holiday campaign for them. And she's like, wow, I've really run the gamut of things to do here. She was scared for a moment when they asked for her ID that they would kick her out and be like, oh, you're banned from Bloomingdale's. And she says, I'm ready for a new start. I'm ready to release the resentment I've been harboring and focus on right now. At this very moment, I'm filled with gratitude for the people in my life and the opportunities that this city has blessed me with. I wouldn't be where I am today without the countless mistakes I made to get here. It's okay to live with regret. It's not okay to let it consume you. Sometimes you have to say fuck it and throw your life down the drain just to see where you'll come out on the other side. The most profound beauty emerges from the ashes of destruction. I was ridiculed for being different and for doing whatever I had to to survive. And now everyone is wearing latex. I guess I really do feel that one thing she embodies is commitment to authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think it comes across as confidence because people are so afraid to commit to authenticity that like even if you're doing it through fear, the fear falls off because people are so afraid of something different. And it is so scary because obviously you have this success story in front of us where you're like, oh, this girl figured out who she was and she just like went whole hog into like wearing a garbage bag down the street and getting photographed whole hog (laughs) whole hog into the garbage whole hog into the garbage it's the garbage of our hearts and people are so inspired and impressed whereas like we don't know the stories where people fully committed to something and it didn't work yeah 
I mean, I think this is an interesting story of reclaiming your narrative and how everything that like, quote unquote, is wrong with her is what makes her interesting. I mean, specifically that story, we talk about it more with her when they try to start that dominatrix Instagram to impersonate her, to try to like shame her with her past. And now that's so much of what people find interesting about her, that like she has had such an interesting different past. Yeah. And I also think it's the way that she kind of faltered a lot and then keeps going. Like people think if I like throw myself into something, will I embarrass myself? And the answer is yes, you will embarrass yourself. And then you just have to own that embarrassment and you have to own that situation. Like she is clearly embarrassed by moments of her past. And instead of like letting the embarrassment consume her, she just said, I'll just add this to my story and repackage it into something that isn't embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And I think people have such a fear of like humiliating themselves and like don't stop to think, but like, okay. And then if I do humiliate myself, how do I flip that on its head and then keep growing and keep changing and keep evolving? And of course, a lot of parts of this story I don't recommend doing. Don't try heroin. Liana was right. That is too far. It is too far. But like do do things with your whole chest. And then if you embarrass yourself, like don't let that win. We have a two hour long interview. We'll see what it gets edited down to with Julia Fox, author herself. We're so excited. Don't forget to get your tickets to the New York City Christmas Spectacular, LA, Phoenix. We still have tickets available for Nashville and Atlanta. DC and Philly. Yeah. And we love you guys so much, but who do we love the most? 